Thank you. Um, all right, welcome everybody to Medicine Grand Rounds, uh, November the 14th here today. We have a special treat today. And, uh, you know, as you know, each um, uh, season we have a chief resident run um, and selected um, clinical pathologic conference. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Charlie Porton Lund, who is the chief resident at EUHM um, to launch us. Charlie. Thanks. Thanks so much, Dr. Armstrong. So I'll go ahead and share the PowerPoint slides here. So we have a great case today that was submitted by one of our residents. Um, just before we get started, I'll mention that uh, none of our presenters have any relevant financial disclosures. Hey, Charlie, and... we have all kinds of weirdness on this display. Oh, okay. Let me You've got like there. three windows. Let's see. And your slides were in presenter view and not the other view. Okay, let's see. Is this looking any better? That looks so much better. Okay, sorry about that. Thanks for interrupting. So, um, just going to go quickly through the learning objectives before I hand it over to Dylan. Uh, so we're going to appreciate a multidisciplinary approach to a case with a neurologic presentation. We'll use precise problem representation to narrow a differential diagnosis, and we'll appreciate the role of pathology in the final diagnosis. And I will mention that um, as our expert discussants speak, the knowledge that they have available to them is exactly the same as what you as the audience have available. Um, so they're speaking with limited knowledge of the case and talking through their thought process at that point in the case. So at this point, I'll hand it off to Dylan, who's going to, he's one of our third year medicine residents, and he's going to present a case of progressive numbness and weakness. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here and uh, discuss this case. So uh, a 51 year old man uh, presented in September of 2023 with eight months of progressive numbness and weakness in his bilateral extremities. At baseline, he was an avid gym goer, worked as a flight attendant, didn't really have any major medical issues. Um, his review of systems uh, on initial interview was notable for a 25 pound weight loss and some dyspnea on exertion, but he denied any fevers, chills, sweats, cough, dysphagia, abdominal pain, bowel or bladder incontinence. So about nine months ago, he was in a car accident and had some uh, lower back injuries um, suffered as a result of that. Approximately a month later, he started noticing some numbness uh, in his uh, both of his feet and his ankles. He got an MRI of his um, lumbar spine that showed um, bulging lumbar discs with varying degrees of neuroforaminal and canal stenosis. Uh, his symptoms progressed over the next three months to include numbness uh, up to his bilateral knees, and he was starting to develop an unsteady gait. Uh, he sought care with an outpatient neurologist who performed an EMG, which was reportedly normal. His symptoms continued to progress despite uh, several courses of physical therapy, uh, and he was starting to develop decreased grip strength. He was falling, uh, and he was forced to take a leave of absence from his job. He got a repeat upper extremity EMG uh, over the summer, which was also reportedly normal. Approximately uh, one month prior to his presentation to us, he had seen his primary care physician who did uh, routine blood work and STI screening, which was all uh, reportedly within normal limits. He also got a repeat uh, MRI of his lumbar and thoracic spine that showed generally improved uh, degenerative changes from uh, when he had his original MRI before. Uh, and then in September, he uh, got a third EMG performed with his outpatient neurologist, which uh, was reportedly concerning for demyelinating neuropathy, and he was immediately referred to the uh, UHM uh, emergency room for workup. In terms of his background, uh, his medical history was notable for hypertension and GERD. For surgical history, he reported a lumbar puncture several years prior for a foot drop, but his uh, symptoms resolved without intervention, and he was never really given a diagnosis. Uh, we didn't have those studies available for our review. Uh, family history was just notable for um, MI and his grandfather. There was no known history of any neurological diseases. He was taking amlodipine, omeprazole, a B12 supplement, an omega-3, and also uh, a workout supplement, uh, allergies to aspirin and penicillin. And in terms of his social history, he lived alone in an apartment uh, he worked as a flight attendant, 
uh, previously doing international routes, but only doing domestic and to the Caribbean within the last year. Uh, and again, he was a very like, avid gym goer, uh, prided himself on his healthy diet. He denied any tobacco, alcohol, or recreational drug use. Uh, he was sexually active with female partners, but had not been had any sexual activity during the duration of his symptoms. Uh, so physical exam, his vitals were all relatively within normal limits, uh, and his general exam was uh, relatively benign. There was uh, the main notable thing was that he did have uh, bilateral cervical lymphadenopathy uh, on the left greater than right. He also had bilateral axillary lymphadenopathy and bilateral inguinal lymphadenopathy. And then his neurological exam. So he was alert and oriented. Uh, his cranial nerves were completely intact. Uh, for his motor exam, he had normal tone, uh, but he did have atrophy of um, his first dorsal interosseous muscles, his biceps, his thighs. Um, he had decreased strength in the upper extremities, um, about four out of five uh, in triceps and grip strength, uh, whereas his deltoid and biceps, his proximal muscles were relatively intact. Uh, but really, his lower extremity strength exam was pretty significant for uh, decreased strength in left hip flexion, left knee flexion, uh, bilateral ankle, uh, dorsi and plantar flexion. Uh, he did have relatively intact right hip and knee strength. His sensation exam was also uh, quite notable for uh, diminished distal vibration and proprioception uh, in a length-dependent pattern, particularly uh, in his lower extremities. Um, he had pretty mute reflexes throughout. He did have one plus brachioradialis reflexes bilaterally, but otherwise absent lower extremity reflexes. He had normal um, coordination with finger, nose, finger, and um, heel, shin. Uh, and he uh, we tried to stand him up out of bed, but he was at a very severely impaired gait um, with a, like a lordotic posture um, requiring crutches. Uh, his routine labs uh, were also very much within normal limits, only notable for a slightly elevated white blood cell count of 13.8. And then a lot of other uh, initial blood work um, also within normal limits. Uh, the only abnormal finding was an elevated vitamin B12 level. Uh, his metabolic, infectious, and inflammatory markers were all um, relatively normal or negative. Okay, thanks, Dylan. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Spencer Hutto. Dr. Hutto is uh, the Associate Program Director for the Adult Neurology Residency, and he's an Assistant Professor within the Division of Hospital Neurology. Perfect. Okay, so thanks so much, Charlie and Dylan, for having me. I just want to begin, um, you know, thinking about the case in the way that neurologists often do. So we approach it from the standpoint of using localization and tempo of disease development to kind of sort through our differential diagnosis. And so, you know, certain things affect certain parts of the nervous system. So if you can identify, you know, what the localization is, you can get a differential diagnosis list just from that. And then when you combine it with the tempo of disease development, you can further filter that list to identify, you know, what are the most likely pertinent um, differential diagnoses. So we'll go on to the next slide, Charlie. And so, you know, I think we can quickly dispense with the idea that this is probably something coming from above the frame and magnum. We're told that the patient had normal cognitive function, um, that the cranial nerves were normal, there were no real mention of bulbar symptoms, and that cerebellar testing was normal. So I think it's more likely that this is a case um, uh, coming from a, a problem arising from the spinal cord, the nerve roots, or perhaps the peripheral nerves. And to sort through that, um, I, I like to use the pattern of weakness um, to, to differentiate um, uh, where uh, the patient's problem is likely coming from. So, you know, we're told that he has uh, widespread atrophy, that the tone is normal, and that reflexes are down. And so all of these things suggest that it's probably lower motor neuron um, in, uh, in the pattern of weakness, which again is more suggestive of a root or, or potentially a peripheral nerve process. You know, the fact that there is sensory impairment pretty much eliminates, you know, the muscle and the neuromuscular junction as being an adequate explanation. So, so yeah, so it's more likely that this is a root um, or peripheral nerve process. Um, I think other reasons to think about why it's not, you know, the spinal cord being involved is there's an absence of bowel and bladder impairment in this case. We know the patient has widespread bilateral, you know, numbness and weakness, and that would involve multiple tracts um, in the spinal cord. And so it would just be rare that he wouldn't have much bowel or bladder involvement if the spinal cord was truly um, the localization. So again, favoring a root and peripheral nerve process. So go to the next slide. <clears throat> 
And so, um, so now we'll use the tempo of disease development to kind of think about, um, you know, what's most likely in this case. And, you know, we're told that he gets pretty, he gets sick pretty quick, um, just a few weeks after the car accident. And then he, over the ensuing nine to 10 months, developed severe disability to the point of having recurrent falls, needing a gait assistive device, and then um, actually having to leave work approaching the time of hospitalization. And so, you know, I think hyperacute etiologies are out of the picture. You know, this is something that develops immediately. Acute problems develop over hours today. So again, this is something that's less likely. So I think we're probably more likely in the subacute to chronic bucket. Um, and then, you know, eliminating some disease categories from this from this bucket, I think, you know, we're, we're not told he doesn't have any medical problems. So the likelihood of a prescribed substance being um, uh, toxic to his nervous system is, is probably less likely. Neurodegenerative processes, um, usually uh, in, in terms of, you know, this type of clinical representation um, are, are typically isolated to motor. And so a lower motor neuron, motor neuron disease, it would not be an adequate explanation here. And then though genetic disorders can happen at a 51 year old, it would be less likely, you know, potentially um, uh, in this case, um, and then also usually it takes years to develop this degree of disability. And so if we go to the next slide um, and we think about these disease categories, the ones that I would consider most likely um, would be inflammatory, neoplastic, perineoplastic, and infectious disorders. And so how do we sort through this um, the, this potential list of, of items. And so I, I, I would recommend the additional diagnostic testing, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about specific etiologies, but some things that I had mentioned wanting to know um, with the initial um, stem that I was given was, you know, what's he doing when he's outside of the country? Is he just staying in his hotel room, getting back on the plane? Is there any real chance that he's exposed to a disease vector? Pain is oftentimes a very telling um, uh, feature of neurologic diseases. So people who have vasculitic neuropathy can have asymmetric neuropathy. And when the nerve gets infarcted, they have a lot of pain with that. So do inflammatory polyradiculopathies, which can be associated with demyelination on EMG. Um, and usually that's, uh, that's related to back pain. Alcohol is a, is a potent peripheral neurotoxin. We just heard now that he doesn't have much uh, history of substance to use. And then, you know, I, I wonder about the MRIs that he got before. We're told it's of the total spine. We're not exactly sure if that's cervical, thoracic, or lumbar. He, it was definitely at least lumbar because they mentioned lumbar disc bulges. But was that done with or without contrast? And contrast would really be necessary to know whether or not um, there is a non-structural radicular process at play. And then we've, I, I was aware of two prior EMGs, but it sounds like the third is actually, you know, suggestive of demyelination. And so we've learned actually quite a bit, you know, from the EMG that was performed just prior to, um, to, to his hospital arrival. And then I think if, you know, pain and temperature is involved on exam, that can further help us refine our localization. And so from that, some things that I might would consider um, in the hospital would be to get an updated EMG and MRIs. Um, some of the serum testing that I suggested, we, we just had um, revealed to us, which hasn't, uh, hasn't um, uh, found us the diagnosis just yet. And then I would think about CSF analysis, so looking for routine studies, um, AFB and fungal cultures, uh, cytology and flow cytometry. And then, you know, we were told that he has some degree of um, lymphadenopathy. And given how severe his neurologic deficits are, I would probably pursue that, you know, up front because uh, we want to try to identify the diagnosis as quickly as possible to give him the best chance of neurologic recovery. And so I think, you know, trying to figure out what's behind the lymphadenopathy is important now. And then depending on what things those things show, considering, um, you know, biopsies from the lymph nodes or the muscle and nerve. And so we'll go to the next slide. And so here's my prioritized differential based on the relative probability. I wasn't aware of the demyelinating aspects of his 30 MG when I when I organized this, but I think um, you know one thing or two things that I would move actually a little bit higher up on this list based on that information is the possibility of poems or um, a demyelinating uh, polyradiculopathy because those things can be associated with demyelination. Um, and uh, they have some potential to be asymmetric, but, you know, vasculitic neuropathies and lymphomas and carcinomas can infiltrate nerves and, um, and nerve roots, and those can oftentimes present with uh, asymmetric findings. They can be rapidly disabling. They can be associated with lymphadenopathy. The same is true for sarcoid um, as the next thing. And then, you know, from a, from a poem's perspective, you know, lymphadenopathy is something that you can see. This is something that will make somebody disabled very quickly. It can have demyelinating features. Neuropathy is actually oftentimes a presenting feature. It is usually symmetric. This case is not terribly asymmetric, but there are some asymmetric features. 
CIDP is typically symmetric, but there are asymmetric um, varieties, but it's neuroimmune disorders are, are very uncommonly associated with lymphadenopathy, so that would be unusual for this case. And of course, infections are associated with lymphadenopathy. Many times they are painful, especially Lyme, you know, syphilis, and CMV. I put perineoplastic disorders on the list because he has lymphadenopathy. I think from a, a base statistical chance that is very unlikely. They're very rare, but if there's a cancer here, then perhaps it's possible. And then we don't really hear anything about the case to suggest porphyria that can cause a relatively um, acute or subacute neuropathy. There's no abdominal or psychiatric symptoms. Amyloid is oftentimes cause a very slowly progressive um, neuropathy. Um, and uh, usually it causes an autonomic neuropathy rather than a sensory motor one. Diabetes wouldn't be a great explanation, I think, for his lymphadenopathy and vitamin deficiencies are usually symmetric and we're um, not aware of any potential risk factors for, uh, for vitamin deficiencies. And so that's how I would um, kind of organize my differential, I think, at this stage. Thank you so much, Dr. Hutto, and, and thank you for sort of playing along with the limited information that you have. So at this point, uh, Dylan's going to give us a little bit of additional information and then kind of uh, in, in, uh, in likeness to real life, we're going to hear a little more information from Dylan, and then one of our general medicine discussants is going to sort of combine together uh, the information from our consultants and from our testing. So Dylan, take it away. Great. So uh, Dr. Hutto, some of the things you asked for are also on our plan. So we did um, proceed with a lumbar puncture on hospital day two. We actually had some pretty remarkable findings. Um, normal opening pressure, um, but with um, pretty significant uh, lymphocytic pleocytosis. Uh, almost entirely uh, lymphocytes on the different on the um, diff. Um, it had undetectably high protein count, uh, normal glucose. Uh, there were study was positive for two oligoclonal bands, uh, and the uh, infectious studies. You know the ones we got immediately were negative, and um, later on, kind of in the course, the uh, later cultures, the AFB culture, the also the perineoplastic antibody panel was negative. The only kind of outlier was this uh, West Nile virus IgM uh, was positive in the CSF. And then we did pursue CT scans. Um, it was chest, abdomen, uh, and pelvis, um, which was notable for prominent lymphadenopathy uh, in the cervical, supraclavicular, bilateral axillary basins, uh, retroperitoneal, iliac, and inguinal lymph nodes. So pretty much um, throughout the body, except um, no mediastinal lymphadenopathy was noted. And then uh, we repeated uh, an EMG. There was actually some concern from the outside EMG uh, that the uh, conduction velocities reported were not quite consistent with demyelination. Uh, so we proceeded to repeat uh, our own. Uh, and on our report, there was evidence of a length-dependent polyradiculoneuropathy. Uh, and then maybe some suggestion of proximal demyelination. And then we did uh, proceed with an MRI of brains uh, and full spine with and without contrast. Unfortunately, the patient had some difficulty tolerating it because of, um, there was some discomfort in his leg from the uh, paresthesia, uh, but from uh, what they could see, make of the images, there was no acute um, intracranial abnormality and no um, significant abnormality in the uh, spinal cord either. Great, thanks, Dylan. So uh, now to kind of help us put the pieces together, we have um, Dr. Meredith Laura, an associate professor with the Department of Medicine. Thanks, Dr. Laura. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so initially, I'm actually going to take a few steps back before the data that we got, um, because I like to just ensure that I've really defined what I believe the problem is that I'm building my differential around. Um, next slide, Charlie. So. Um, I think it's important to identify which features you think are the most important in a case um, so that then you decide whether or not to include those in your problem representation. And similar to what Dr. Hutto said, um, the exposures potentially could raise increase, um, increase the chance of an infectious etiology. Um, the uh, painless sensory involvement and the type of uh, pattern that he has consists with a large fiber peripheral neuropathy, which I think is important because a lot of systemic diseases that we encounter causing a small fiber painful neuropathy like with diabetes or HIV. Uh, the lymphadenopathy and weight loss, lots of concern for a, a systemic process. And the dyspnea exertion I just thought was really interesting because I wondered about either a systemic respiratory process versus phrenic nerve involvement from the actual neuropathy. Next slide. So in the end, I ended up encapsulating this problem as um, 
51 year old flight attendant with a remote history of foot drop. I just wasn't ready to let go of that yet. Um, now presenting with a chronic progressive large fiber peripheral neuropathy with palpable lymphoid neuropathy. And so now that we have our problem, it's, I, I think that our problem representation essentially includes two major problems that as Dr. Hutzo did, it's important to find the overlap. And I don't want to repeat this too much because I think he already did a fantastic job of highlighting basically what um, uh, neurologic syndromes can also be um, include lymphadenopathy. And so just to um, add a couple of comments here, neurosarcoidosis with polyneuropathy as a presenting component um, could be at play here <clears throat> that will examine vasculitic neuropathy, um, either as a, a primary vasculitic neuropathy or part of a larger systemic syndrome like Church-Strauss or GPA. Lymphoma in this case, high concern, um, particularly um, given the amount of weight loss he has, as well as the diffuse lymphadenopathy, and could manifest both as a perineoplastic syndrome and an immune-mediated polyneuropathy, or actually infiltrate the nerves um, and cause a lymph lymphomatous meningitis-like picture. Poems is also a great consideration if there were a monoclonal, like a plasma cell dyscrasia that ended up causing a polyneuropathy associated with that. And then, you know, I, I have to include HIV here because HIV can do all the things. Um, so if you can go into the next slide, Charlie. So I think the next step is to take, once you have your differential, you have formed your differential, you then want to examine the data as it applies to your differential. Okay, so th thinking about let, what does this data mean to me through the lens of the differential that I have uh, formed thus far. And so I just want to highlight some of the data, but sort of almost name it with a greater precision and how that's affecting my um, thought process at this point. And so we've already kind of mentioned a lot, uh, the, loss, um, the loss of proprioception and the painless sensory loss and what that means. Um, it is interesting because it, he is sort of, he has symmetric symptoms, but with patchy weakness. So he has that sort of asymmetric component that I think Dr. Hudson did a much better job uh, than I about explaining how that might implicate in this process. Looking at the negative inflammatory markers and the fact that the imaging does not show any pulmonary parenchymal abnormalities, those are really critical pertinent negatives to me just because the, the, the level of stability and the rapidity of this guy's progression um, seemed very concerning for potential vasculitic neuropathy. But I think the lack of inflammatory markers without those parenchymal abnormalities significantly lowers that on my differential and because now we have this demyelinating component as well. Let's take a look at the CSF. So that lymphocytic pleocytosis with almost an out of proportion, highly elevated protein kind of reminds you of sort of what you think about that concept of albuminocytologic dissociation. But this is not actually an albuminocytologic dissociation because that requires that you have less than 10 white blood cells. Um, and so um, th it does bring to mind things like CIDP or things that where the, the antibody itself um, are in high quantities, uh, proteins in high quantities, anybody's form and can, can affect thing, things through an immune-mediated mechanism. And then the EMG just confirming that length-dependent polyridiculoneuropathy. Radiculo is important because you need, need to kind of think about syndromes that also involve the nerve root with a primary demyelinating component. Importantly, no SPEP, UPEP, or serum-free light chains have been sent at this point, which I think is um, an important piece that I would want to consider to, to finalize the diagnosis. Okay, so um, next slide, please. And so the next is just a Venn diagram, taking into account some of those nuances um, uh, and sort of thinking about, well, how does that mirror our differential? So if you can go to the next slide. And so what I typically do now is before we took the data um, and we um, applied it to our differential, now let's take a differential and apply it to the data that we have, okay? And so what I'd like to do is sort of, what I, I like doing um, a comparative differential diagnosis but instead of looking at the whole, each of the whole syndromes, identify certain components that may be differentiators or contain differentiating features. Some features in each illness script, which is kind of what I would call each column here, can they can either be supportive features, meaning that they support that diagnosis. Um, they can be discriminating features, meaning they can sort of um, identify, um, be critical to like um, either lowering or raising that, um, that item in your differential. And sometimes that it's actually incompatible. Certain features, um, if they're present, that means you can't have that diagnosis. And then there are a lot of other data that sort of stands neutral. And so um, if you can go to the next slide, Charlie, I've tried to identify that by um, highlighting in green or red, 
the data in this case, whether um, the data in this case, how that plays out within each illness script. So let me explain. So let's actually start from the right that currently has the most red. Um, I do want to correct one thing in here from what that I've learned from Dr. Hutto here. So my first thought was, could this be an AL amyloidosis with a, like a POEM syndrome um, from an underlying plasma cell dyscrasia? The timeline fits. It seems like it's typically, from my reading, it's typically painful and has a, an autonomic component associated with it, which we do not see here. Um, I thought that uh, typically it's axonal, but I'm actually learning from Dr. Hutto here that it's demyelinating, which could actually raise this up in my differential. We don't see any of the other classic systemic signs like crab symptoms, organomegaly, um, which I um, have highlighted in red, but somebody who's more expert on this might say, oh, well, that doesn't eliminate this as a possibility. Um, and so, you know, quite a bit of red, but with a demyelination, I think that that might sort of keep this in play for a moment. Neurosarcoidosis here with peripheral neuropathy. I think, first of all, neurosarcoidosis with isolated peripheral neuropathy would be a little bit unusual, but can definitely happen. It's very typically axonal neuropathy, um, which we have a component of here, but it's not demyelinating. But importantly, the lymphadenopathy that spares the mediastinum should really significantly lower this on our differential, because this is one of those features, neurosarcoidosis or sarcoidosis, if it's involving lymphadenopathy in the chest, we'll almost always have that mediastinal component. And so I think that's really important to consider here. And then let's look at these two to the left. So I kind of threw a curveball in here because it wasn't on my Venn diagram, but a lot of the features of um, the way that his neuropathy is presenting really reminded me of CIDP, um, in particular, the demyelinating component and a, um, the polyradiculo neuropathy component um, it, I don't know if this progression is typical of CIDP or if it's, I, I think it can typically be a little bit more indolent, but I think with the symmetric nature, but with the patchiness that we saw on exam can be quite consistent. The fact that it's a large fiber demyelinating uh, polyradicular neuropathy, also quite consistent. But what's quite inconsistent is that it shouldn't really have any um, systemic signs and symptoms if it's a primary syndrome. And we should have the true albuminocytologic dissociation with minimal pleocytosis. And so you could actually say, well, does that actually rule this out? And then lastly, looking at non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, could this be a lymphoma that's producing so much protein that it's actually infiltrating the nerves? I think while the lymphomatous components here are quite suspect, like the B symptoms, the palpable and diffuse lymphadenopathy on imaging, the lympho lymph lymphocytic pleocytosis in the CSF, there are quite a few aspects of lymphomatous meningitis that are not present in our data. So no radicular pain, no focal weakness, no cranial nerve involvement, no leptomeningeal enhancement, no nerve root thickening on our MRI. So I, I think that we really have to rule out the lymphomatous meningitis as a possibility here as the primary pathology. And so in the end, I wasn't able, and so I, I think that uh, what, I, what I thought about here is, okay, so we have a progression that reminds me a lot of CIDP or an immune-mediated demyelinating polyradicular neuropathy. And we have many features concerning for a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and so going back to our original Venn diagram, if you think about could a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma be causing an immune-mediated demyelinating polyradicular neuropathy as a perineoplastic syndrome? And I think that's my leading diagnosis at this case. I would really want that S and UPEP in particular after causes of primary demyelinating, because I think there are quite a few features of poem that are present here, even though we don't see a lot of the other classic features um, that would actually be more minor criteria. So I'd recommend the next step would include a lymph node biopsy with flow cytometry, and then we consider a nerve biopsy if inconclusive. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Laura. So um, both Dr. Hutto and Dr. Laura uh, chose the exact correct next step, which is what happened in real life. Um, so we, uh, or Dylan and his team did proceed with a lymph node biopsy. Um, and so we have um, Dr. Saja Asakrov, an assistant professor in hematopathology, who actually um, was part of the team that read this lymph node biopsy here to review the slides with us. Sure. You guys can hear me? Yes. We can. All right. Great. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. Um, and again, for pathology workup, what we got is a biopsy, which is an excisional biopsy, beautiful biopsy from the right axillary lymph node. And uh, that was in September 12th. 
And uh, there was a flow cytometry, which I will discuss uh, as well in the coming slide. A bone marrow biopsy, which was also done for staging, and that was showed involvement. And a CSF uh, cytology and a flow cytometry. And the flow cytometry on all three specimens showed exact same findings. Um, so let's move on to the next slide, which is the right axillar biopsy. And if you look right, uh, the one in the right, which I'm just showing you to compare, is a normal lymph node. And if you look at that normal lymph node, you can see nice, there is at the periphery a nice pink capsule. And you can see some sort of architecture. You can see the these nice round germinal centers, follicles, and then you can see this pink in the side, and it, the, what we call the sinusite in the middle, the center of that normal lymph node, and you can see how patent and nice it is. And now when you, when you compare that picture with the adjacent one, which is the patient lymph node, it's completely different. You don't see the same architecture. The whole thing is um like uh, it's gone and you can see this kind of a diffuse process, a diffuse lymphoid process. Um, but also you can see what, what I would like to call it like a cloudy appearance. If you can see there is this dark um, areas and there's a little bit alternating um, kind of lighter pinkish areas. and. And if you look at the higher magnified region from the dark area, so looking at this face architecture, you know this is a lymphoma. This is not a reactive lymph node because it's completely lost the architecture. Then the next step, you know it's a diffuse process. And then the next step, uh, you can see that again, this there is this alternating dark and light area. And if you look at the dark area, the, the magnified one in the bottom, you can see that these are small lymphocytes and nice monomorphic looking small lymphocytes with a very high NC, NC ratio, scant cytoplasm, and the nuclear chromatin is a dot-like or kind of like a cracked, muddy cracked, or uh, the other term is the uh, sucker appearance, uh, nuclear chromatin. And then if you go to the top magnified region, um, and these are the light areas, you can see it's a little bit more polymorphic. You can see there's a little bit more cytoplasm. The pinkish air, the pink staining is the cytoplasm. Uh, some of the lymphocytes start having like a prominent nucleoli in the center. And this is what we call the immunoblast or the paraimmunoblast. And this area uh, is called the proliferation centers. And this is characteristic morphology that we see in CLL. Uh, if we move to the next slide, a flow cytometry was done. Uh, and if you look at the first plot, uh, 19 versus 20, look, follow the uh, pink area. So the pink area is 19 positive and 20 positive. So these are B cells. And then if you look, it's not just 19 positive, but it's also five positive, this next plot. So it's a five positive B cells, and that is an aberrant finding, an aberrant phenotypic finding. CD5 is usually a T cell marker, but when we see it on B cells, we know it's an aberrant finding. And, and then these B cells are also CD200 positive, which is a, a, what we see in CLL. And then if you, uh, look at kappa lambda, again, the pink area, which is the CD5 positive B cells are all lambda restricted. So the, and, and again, this, the same, the same phenotypic features, the same characteristic in flow cytometry was seen in the bone marrow, in the lymph node, in, in the CSF. So what we have is a lambda restricted CD5 positive B cells. So consistent with a lymphoma. So when we have a CD5 positivity, one of the things that we think about as a differential CLL or mantle cell lymphoma. And if we go to the next uh, slide, and that's the role uh, of the fish. And if you look at this, uh, 
the fish was negative for translocation 1114, which is important to exclude and to rule out. 1114 is a rearrangement that is see, seen in mantle cell lymphoma. And what's positive uh, is a trisomy 12 in 56% of cells. And if you look at the fish, you can see the three red dots and three green dots. So that's considered, usually you have to have two green and two reds. That's the normal. But when you have three red and three green, that is a trisomy 12. And trisomy 12 is a frequent genetic, cytogenetic aberration uh, that is seen in CLL, uh, probably around 20%. So we excluded, uh, excluded mantle cell. And um, again, with this characteristic morphology, with this characteristic phenotype, and uh, it's consistent with a CLL, SLL. Um, if we go to the next uh, slide, um, now, uh, typically, what we when we think about uh, CLL, we think about lymphocytosis. Um, but some uh, some percentage of patients uh, present only with uh, like SLL or more like a lymphoma rather than uh, uh, bone marrow and uh, peripheral blood-based uh, disease or leukemia. Uh, this patient uh, at the beginning really didn't show that much of a, um, a lymphocytosis. It, it, the patient did present with leukocytosis, but it's due to neutrophilia, not due to lymphocytosis. And in, and not really, there is no anemia, no uh, cytopenia, the platelet looks fine. Other than neutrophilia, that's the only um, abnormal presentation that we can see in the CBC data. And then uh, the next slide shows the bone marrow. And you can see the bone marrow biopsy. Uh, usually when you, uh, it's a hypercellular bone marrow. Um, uh, and And you can see it's a monomorphic at low power you can see there's a monomorphic, monomorphic infiltration. Usually uh, at low power, when you see a normal bone marrow, it's not, it's a different cell size, different colors, uh, usually a polymorphic population, but you can see there's a lot of blue here. And uh, the bone marrow aspirate, again, it shows you the same lymphocytes. These are small lymphocytes. And you can, if you compare to the adjacent megakaryocytes or the adjacent, uh, there's one large cells, probably it's a myeloid cells. You can see these are small. Uh, scant cytoplasm, again, this uh, kind of cracked uh, nuclear chromatin, which is uh, characteristic or typical, typically seen in CLL. Um, um, uh, so the bone marrow had around like 70 to 80% involvement by the same small lymphocytes, which again, it's consistent with CLL, SLL. Um, so if we move again to the next slide, um, uh, I guess that's, that's um, uh, the other, uh, other test that was done uh, I, I believe the SPEP showed the IgM lambda paraprotein, which which can be seen in CLL. Sometimes when we think of IgM, we think of about uh, ruling out myeloma. Uh, but this patient had didn't have the uh, clonal plasma cells. It it had uh, uh, it was consistent with CLL. Um, and then this is the uh, pathological description. Again, uh, other immunostain. If you see that we did, it's five and twenty three strong. That twenty three is another. Um, characteristic phenotype that's seen in CLL, and it can be helpful in differ differentiating it from other uh, small uh, uh, small B-cell lymphomas. Uh, okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Asikra. So um, we're going to just put up uh, some of the reads of the information here. Um, I, I know there's probably not enough time to digest all of the writing, so we can share this information with you afterwards if anyone's interested. Um, but as I, Dr. Arsica said, this is the final read, which is consistent with, with everything she just explained to us. Um, and then the uh, peripheral blood as well as bone marrow biopsy flow cytometry were all consistent with um, a, a B-cell lymphoma or a CLL slash SLL. Um, and then just to round out um, some of the studies that had been asked for earlier in the case, um, there was a positive EBV IgG test done, and uh, sort of interestingly, the West Nile virus serology was elevated. Um, we mentioned that the free light chains elevated free kappa and lambda. Um, and then just looking through the genetic analyses, as Dr. Jessica mentioned, positive for trisomy 12, um, and then most of the other uh, testing negative. 
Um, so we sort of have our answer at this point. So we're going to turn to our expert in this condition, Dr. Amelia Langston, who's the medical director for Winship and a professor and executive vice chair within the Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology, and who also is um, taking care of this patient right now. So I'll pass it off to Dr. Langston. Thanks very much. Um, in the next few minutes, I'm going to try to provide just a little bit of context for what I hope um, you already appreciate, and that is that um, this is a very oddball presentation of a common um, leukemia. So just to put the frame things out, the malignant cells in CLL, SLL, or mature B lymphocytes, um, when they circulate in the blood and live in the bone marrow, we call it CLL. When they um, uh, reside in the bone in the lymph nodes, and this is primarily a nodal presentation of disease, um, we call it SLL. But it's the same disease. And it is our most common uh, form of leukemia, and it affects people in the later um, decades of life. Now, thinking about clinical presentation, um, uh, it's important to understand that a substantial fraction of patients with CLL, SLL will be picked up incidentally, usually because of an abnormal CBC, but occasionally because of palpable adenopathy on a routine exam. The most common symptoms that we see in CLL, SLL are pretty nonspecific, but I'll point out a couple of things that I think are important. First of all, CLL is, SLL is an immune deficiency disease, and these patients are hypogammaglobulinemic, and they do get opportunistic infections. The other point I'll make is that it is an immune dysregulation disease, and autoimmune phenomena are not uncommon. The most common autoimmune phenomena that we see is autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and that occurs in about 10%. Uh, of patients. Next slide. Now, I'm not going to get uh, into the weeds with the usual management of disease, except to say that uh, uh, the uh, a substantial fraction of patients don't require any therapy if they're asymptomatic. Um, and uh, we take a wait and watch approach because we don't have curative medical therapies. But what we do have now are a whole group of targeted therapies that have largely replaced um, uh, conventional chemotherapy in the management of disease until very late stages. The BTK inhibitors, um, uh, which uh, uh, act on Bruton's tyrosine kinase, which is an important part of the signaling apparatus in the B cell. Uh, the BTK inhibitors are typically first-line therapy for most patients. And this is attractive because they're oral drugs, but they are, again, not curative. And the treatment has to continue until either the patient fails or becomes intolerant uh, of therapy. The only potentially curative therapy for CLL, SLL is allogeneic transplantation, uh, but this is generally reserved for patients either who have multiply relapsed disease, who have very high risk disease, or patients who have had Richter transformation into a high grade lymphoma. Next slide. Now, neurologic disease can take a bunch of different forms in the leukemias and lymphomas. We can certainly have leukemic meningitis, which this patient has, but, we, but, but CLL can also form uh, tumors uh, with cord compression and other kinds of mass effects. We can have parenchymal brain or cord lesions in, um, uh, in uh, leukemia. We can have nerve root infiltration, which has uh, already been alluded to, and we can see perineoplastic syndromes. But when we think about the leukemias and neurologic manifestations, by far the most common leukemia associated with neurologic dis problems is ALL, uh, followed by lymphoid blast crisis of CML, followed by AML, and CLL is way, way down there on the totem pole in terms of the frequency of clinically manifest neurologic problems. Next problem. So just how uncommon is CNS involvement or neurologic involvement in CLL? 
And the, the short answer is it is reportable. And there are about 200 case reports or a small case series in the literature of neurologic manifestations of CLL. So it's not a common problem. Now, on the other hand, autopsy studies, the largest of which was one published way back in the 1980s, um, suggest, all of them suggest that pathologic involvement of um, uh, the nervous system by CLL is not so uncommon. And in this large series, uh, about 8% of patients had leukemic meningitis at the time of death and 7% had brain lesions. But I think it's important to point out this, there are no, no autopsy studies in the modern era and the subjects in this uh, study all had advanced disease and most died with uncontrolled CLL. But on the other hand, the neurologic findings in most of these cases were unanticipated based on the clinical course of the patient. Now, in terms of living patients and thinking about how um, uh, uh, this uh, uh, might play out, uh, the, the largest series looking at neurologic involvement uh, uh, in CLL is from Mayo Clinic, and they looked at over 4,000 patients with CLL, and they specifically excluded patients with known Richter syndrome because we know that high-grade lymphomas um, uh, affect the nervous system with some frequency. Uh, but they excluded those patients. And what they found uh, was that about 4% of patients had had an MRI or an LP or both for evaluation of some sort of neurologic symptom. And interestingly, when they looked at uh, the results of the, the studies and what turned out to be the problem, CLL was <laughs> accounted for only 10% of those um, uh, uh, cases as the explanation for the neurologic problems. So infection and autoimmune phenomena were at the top of the list. Richter's transformation was found in almost 10% of patients in whom it had not been um, previously anticipated. There were other cancers, which goes along with the fact that we know that CLL patients have an increased frequency of other cancers. And then there were a variety of kind of other things that accounted. So about 0.4% of patients with CLL have clinically manifest CLL uh, uh, accounting for neurologic problems. So next slide. So how did I think about this patient? Um, I did not see this patient in the hospital, but um, I'll say, you know, the new diagnosis of CLL and SLL, the presence of the CLL cells in the CSF is very clear. The neurologic symptoms, as we've already talked about, were profound and with studies, you know, consistent with a, a demyelination pattern. Um, the autoimmune and perineoplastic studies were negative, but that does not rule out the possibility that uh, uh, this could be a perineoplastic uh, process. Although I think it's fair to say that the lack of other inflammatory markers makes that much less likely. But I think we have to think as in terms of explaining what was going on with this patient. He's obviously got leukemic meningitis could certainly have a perineoplastic component. There could be an unrelated second problem, but I don't think so. Next. So what has happened? So again, I didn't take care of this patient in the hospital, but what the first thing that was done uh, in, the, in, in the hospital was the patient was given high dose steroids and has been on a slow taper, which I think just ended very recently. And it's important to understand that steroids in and of themselves will have an anti-leukemic as well as an anti-inflammatory effect. Um, ibrutinib, which is one of the BTK inhibitors, was given as first-line therapy that was started a little bit after the high-dose steroids. And I will point out that ibrutinib does penetrate the CSF, but in terms of, again, in this uncommon situation, understanding whether or not that's really adequate for treatment, there really are conflicting anecdotal reports in the literature. Uh, of either treatment failure or clearance of CSF in patients with, uh, uh, with leukemic meningitis from um, CLL. Now, when I saw the patient in clinic, um, he had been out of the hospital for several weeks, had been to rehab and PT and OT, and he was much improved. 
um, but still with significant sensory and motor deficits. He was able to walk um, without a cane, although he was he was using a cane uh, for routine uh, ambulation, uh, but he still had significant uh, deficits. So um, we did uh, initiate uh, uh, additional LPs with intrathecal therapy. Uh, I will say that the nucleated cell count had dropped from 73 to 20 uh, uh, by the time I uh, first saw the patient. The protein, which had been greater than 200, was down to 86. And after two intrathecals, his last nucleated cell count was down to 11 with a pro slightly uh, uh, elevated protein of 66. And his neurologic symptoms and signs were continuing to improve. Next slide. So what did I learn? What do I think you should take away from this patient? I, I'm incredibly impressed by our blinded um, uh, discussants at coming up with lymphoma as uh, being at the top of the list. But that having been said, this is not the usual CLL, SLL patient. Um, and uh, I think the fact that the patient had systemic symptoms as well as adenopathy raised appropriately raised a red flag about the possibility of uh, of a malignancy. I'm still not completely sure about the full explanation for the patient's neurologic symptoms, but what is clear is we got to treat what we can measure. <laughs> And what we could measure was leukemic cells in the CSF and the elevated protein and his, his um, uh, neurologic exam. So this is really um, uh, a person that in contrast to the usual CLL patient that we might see in clinic where we put them on therapy and kind of send them on their way, this is a person that I'm gonna be following extremely closely uh, because uh, uh, I think we need to uh, make sure that we uh, uh, address this problem carefully given the gravity of his neurologic uh, presentation. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Langston, and thank you to all of our discussants. Um, I will defer to Dr. Armstrong on whether we have time for a few questions. I did just want to point out that Dr. Hutto has to step off the call in a minute, so I just wanted to give you a minute or two if you had any uh, thoughts looping back on kind of the EMG. It was a little confusing, the demyelinating, any or any of the other tests. Well, I, I think this is a really fascinating case, and thanks for having me, um, uh, you know, kind of weigh in. So I guess if I, you know, if I had to kind of put it all together and just think a little bit about what's most likely, you know, the cause of the patient's neurologic disease, I, I would favor that this is an issue of, of you know, leukemic infiltration, because what, what we have when we say it's meningitis is really that something is just within the subarachnoid space and filling it. And so in this case, uh, uh, you know, the, the nerve roots pass through this space. So anything that's within it will coat the nerve roots and there's a potential for it to directly invade the nerve roots. And we, uh, you know, we clearly have that there are leukemic cells in the CSF as proven by you know, flow cytometry and cytology. And then and then we have the additional information and follow-up about how the patient seems to be responding to treatment. So I think I, I probably favor leukemic infiltration. And then, you know, there is this talk about, um, I think uh, maybe a pair of protein that was identified that can definitely cause, you know, different types of neuropathies. And so I would kind of, you know, think about that additionally being contributory, but but that that's what I, I, I think I would favor, but really fascinating case and really well um, done by the team that actually saw the patient. Yeah, just to, to bring up one other point um, about leukemic meningitis, you know, when we think about leukemic meningitis, again, most of the patients that um, uh, have leukemic meningitis have acute leukemia, they have these very big cells, and I, they get stuck at the base of the brain. So the co most common presentations that we see of leukemic meningitis are actually cranial nerve palsies and, and, and problems uh, uh, related to uh, uh, the the uh, to that, but these are tiny cells, and so you know at least in my sort of simplistic way of thinking about it, I think these cells can probably traverse down the spinal column. And when when I talked to this guy, one of the interesting historical things that he said was it was almost like this marched up my body. It started in the bottoms of my feet and then marched up. And then all of a sudden it was involving my arms um, uh, as well. And so it, it may be the combination of the fact that these cells are very small and the effects of gravity that kind of account for why this was not a typical presentation of leukemic meningitis.
That's super interesting. Um, I just, Amy, I wanted to ask you a quick question. You alluded to this already, but I was really struck by your slide that um, in cases of CLL, that the neurologic manifestations so often turned out to be secondary to a different cause. Um, and one of those was autoimmune. When you see sort of autoimmune phenomenon with this, is it like, are there lots of other systemic manifestations that sort of make that clear or can it, because, you know, it, it doesn't seem like it's going to be a cult infection. It, it seems like it's probably going to be CLL, SLL, but it doesn't seem like it could be a cult infection because now they've been treated with steroids and a whole bunch of things and are clearly improving. So the only other thing I was sort of thinking is, is there any, you know, still any chance of an, a, an unrecognized autoimmune process? But again, you, you mentioned inflammatory markers. Do you usually see lots of other manifestations that would clue you into that? You know, uh, I think I think the short answer is um, autoimmune phenomena travel together. But again, the most common autoimmune manifestations we see are actually hematologic. So autoimmune hemolytic anemia, occasionally autoimmune thrombocytopenia or neutropenia. Um, and, and so this just is, is uh, I. I don't think we know, but but it is not uncommon that there is more than one autoimmune thing uh, going on when when that occurs in CLL. Yeah, it's utterly fascinating. Any anybody else have questions? Well, I, I have to say. I realize, Charlie, you're probably the person who's supposed to close this, but that was a really masterful discussion. This was a, a fantastic CPC, and our discussions were absolutely phenomenal. And um, and I want to thank all of you guys um, and you, um, Charlie and Martin, for putting this together. Yeah, I really, I'm incredibly impressed by the blinded discussants. <laughs> Spencer and Meredith, I think you can take a bow. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Yeah, very Thank much a pleasure you. to be a part of this. Thanks for the opportunity, y'all. Thanks so much.